when my wife almost died in 2012, um, it was almost like, because she went and had a bike accident, and it was a very long, slow recovery, so we just didn't know for a long time how she'd be. But it was almost like a second conversion for me. In that, the, you know, which was a great, great, the people were praying for us. The Lord drew very close to me. And uh, I think it's because people were praying so much. So, you know, and I found uh, there were, there were I, it is such, it's etched in my mind this how, how he drew near in a time of suffering. You know, my, my experience isn't the paradigm for everyone because, right, Job is often in agony. And she was getting a little better each day. And there's different kinds of suffering, and there's why, and uh, physical pain that won't go away. So I'm not trying to give a, a simplistic answer at the end of the day. But encounter with God is what Job is all about. Okay, so, you know, we, we could talk about Job forever, right? Do you, but do you want to say anything? Yeah. Yahweh actually shows up to give a response instead of just letting Job and his friends stay there and talk and never provide an answer? I, I think um, cl clearly I would say that happens in life, right? In, so to speak. But in a sense, it's because we, we shouldn't be surprised because I, I, I guess I'm answering theologically. God wants us to know these things. I mean, that's why it's there. So in, a, so in a sense, we shouldn't be surprised because how do we know that God wants us to know? Because we have Job. So my answer is a little bit of a tautology. How do we know God wants us to know? Because we have Job. And so I guess we shouldn't be surprised because God's revealed it this way. I mean, so in a way, my answer is, no, we shouldn't be surprised because the story is the way it is, <laughs> which is what kind of answer is that, you know? But it is the answer, I think, that's right. God, why is this book here? God wants us to know these things. He revealed it to his people. He reveals it to us. So I don't think he's, is it a surprise? God doesn't want us to be surprised because it's here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So they weren't expecting no. No, I think it was a surprise to them. I think Job had some things to learn, and obviously the friends had a lot of things to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the significance that in God's providence, the book of Job came about so early, um, probably prior to the Pentateuch and all of that? Well, um, I, do, I do hold an early date for Job. I mean, that's not, the, that's not absolutely clear, right, that it's, that it's early. I tend to think the dating of the book is not that significant, although I do take an early date. Um, so, but if that's right, I guess uh, if, if that's right that it was, I mean, we, we have an interesting example of when was it written exactly, we don't know, but perhaps you could say that it would counterbalance a wrong understanding from the beginning of the curses and blessings in Deuteronomy and of a wrong understanding of Proverbs, that it'd be out there right from the beginning, maybe. I haven't really thought that much about that, but yeah, yeah. Paul has mentioned that Job is a response to retribution theology. So the Old Testament people believe that if you sin, you're, you're punished. No. Uh, how, how clear is that actually in the book? Or do you think that's more just a byproduct of analysis? I think that's just a canonical statement. That you have, you have something like Proverbs, you, you do good, you're rewarded. Job counteracts, a, I would say, Job counteracts a misunderstanding of Proverbs. Actually, I think if you read Proverbs carefully, Proverbs has the other theme in there uh, of injustice. But... Yeah, I, we could say, in terms of the whole canon, at least Job and Ecclesiastes, they, they counteract a, a superficial understanding of uh, reward and punishment. So I don't like the word corrects, as if it implies that the, if it implies that a proverb somehow would say, what? <laughs> I didn't know that but that it gives us a, sh a whole contour and shape of the canon, I'm happy to accept it in that way. 
Sacrifices for his his children. In the very first chapter. Is there a aside from maybe praying for our kids devotionally that sort of thing? What sort of a New Testament application might there be for parents serving as the you know and the role of priest or whatever? In the world? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good. I don't know. I mean, obviously we wouldn't do that, would we? Um, so. I think it would be more general prayer, instruction, um, exhortation. I mean, I think of that even now. You know, our four kids, they're 35 to 27. They've, all, they've grown up. But, y you know, a good parent, I, if I, you know, you got to be careful. I mean, you don't want to, our, our kids are all doing great spiritually. We're really pleased with where they are. So, um but I do think of things that I can say still that are helpful if I see something going on in their life. And, uh, you know, our kids, we're friends. I mean, now sometimes I'll say something to them and they'll push back. If, you know, I give something like, well, yeah, uh, we'll listen and we might have a little conversation. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, okay. I think that pushback was good. And sometimes I'll, I'll keep pushing a little bit. <laughs> sacrifices for his family and for his kids. It's been a mystery to me because it says he was upright, he eschewed the evil, you know, he was no, a no. righteous man. No. And he offered sacrifices on behalf of his kids in case they were, you know, being delegates. And so I just In case they were what? Uh, uh, I didn't. off of the pucker brush. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so um, I don't I don't know. I I mean honestly, um, ask your old testament professors. I haven't really thought about that the way you're asking it. That's a really good question. Yeah, Job was an early Catholic. Yeah, so <laughs> I did not say that. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just don't know. Do, do anybody have a thought on that? You have a thought on that? Not about that. Would you have any advice for when you're trying to comfort someone who's suffering? You want to comfort them by saying, well, God's so but then not to come across as uncaring or unsympathetic or just to kind of a brush away. God's sovereign, yeah. you should just be able yeah. to get over your problem. Well, I mean, you know, the scripture says, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. I think the first thing is always if they know that you care about them. And then, then there are times, there are times we, I think we can say something. I, I think it's very particular and, and situation specific. But the, I, I agree with Carson in the, his book, How Long, O oh Lord, the best way is to prepare people in advance, you know? So that, so that really you, like when Diane, uh, I mean, I felt like I had gotten so much good teaching when Diane had her accident. Did anybody say to me, you know, God works everything together for good? I don't think anybody did. But I knew that, and I believed it. And um, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I wouldn't have been offended if anybody had said it to me. I don't think anybody did. So the problem is, I think, if we say something like that and it comes out across as just kind of like thud, <laughs> it doesn't seem to fit. It seems like some kind of alien word that doesn't resonate with what's happening to the person, you know? But that's, that's hard to know. I've seen Bruce Ware, who's my best friend, I've seen Bruce Ware right when somebody's suffering share Romans 8.28. And I think he's done it well. Can that be done wrong, badly? That can be done really badly, <laughs> really badly. So it's hard to have a rule, but that's why God gives us wisdom, right? Pastoral wisdom is having a feel for a situation. Uh, when I say feel, God, God gives wisdom in situations. You know, here, here's an example. So can I give you, an, I'm, I'm thinking of a situation where I've had students, no one in here is like this, okay, about what I'm going to say. This, and this is very rare. Our students are great. I love our students. But I've had students in classes, they're doing something in the class, I mean talking by doing something, and everybody in the class is saying, be quiet, and uh, what you're doing right now is strange. And they don't know. Do you see what I'm saying? They don't know that everybody in the room is thinking, you shouldn't be doing this. 
well, here's my worry. How are they going to be a pastor? You don't know what everybody in the room's thinking. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have that feel of what to do in a pastoral situation because I know what they're thinking. I don't, it's not even bothering me. It might be doing something that's a little odd in their relationship with me as a teacher, but honestly, that doesn't bother me. I'm like, fine, but I'm like, oh, <laughs> you don't know what everybody in the room's thinking right now. But what God, I think what God gives, uh, one, one, that doesn't mean that person's a bad person, but it probably means they won't ever be a pastor. You know, I, all the students I know like that, they're not in pastoral ministry now because they come in and they do things and it's just like, I don't know how to relate to people. But those who are called to the pastorate, God gives them, I mean, not infallibly, we all make mistakes, right? But God gives you a sense of what to say in situations, of how to comfort people. I mean, nobody's perfect, but a person who has no idea, they, yeah, they're, they're trouble. Yeah. So I've heard it said that what the three friends did right was they spent a week just in yeah. Silence before yeah. they started mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Three weeks of silence. I mean, we had, uh, we, we have a situation very recently in our church where the husband committed adultery. Um, just last week, the wife came over to our house, and when she came in, I just hugged her. I, I, I didn't say anything. You know, I could have said I'm sorry, but I just felt like I'm just going to hug her. You know, just the, the pain of what she went through. And then we sat down and talked about things. And there were other people, there was another elder with me and Diane was there and so forth and so on. So, yeah. Anything else about Job? Okay, well, speaking of going fast, how about the Psalms? Now, how, how in the world do you do the Psalms in a class like this? The answer, you don't. <laughs> right? I mean, even when I put, did these notes, look how long my notes are on the Psalms, <laughs> you know? Because I looked at this and thought, I don't know what to, even when I wrote the chapter, I don't know what to do. There's so many. So I just thought maybe it's just helped to think a big picture in the Psalms, just to, to think of various things. I, I like books one and two focus on David's life. I basically follow Hamilton here. Then book three, there's discouragement over the Davidic kings not reigning, or another way to put that is exile, right? Book four, book four you have a new exodus. Book five, praise with the coming of a new David. Is there, so a lot of people are doing work on this nowadays, is there this kind of movement in the Psalms? I think there is. And by the way, Jim Hamilton, uh, is writing a commentary on the Psalms from this perspective, which will be, a Crossway is releasing a 12 volume commentary on the Bible, um, and Jim is doing the Psalms. None of those volumes are out yet. So, um, so I, 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 think, I think that's helpful, but you know, to get into the weeds of this, we, <laughs> I, don't, I just don't think we have time for it. I, you know, we see psalms of lament and praise. I agree with those who see Psalm 1 and 2 as the introduction to the whole Psalter. What does it mean? What does it mean to belong to the Lord? That, well, you have a wisdom psalm at the beginning. You meditate on the law of the Lord day and night, right? And then Psalm 2 is a psalm about the king. So um, there's just a lot, a lot we could say there. Um, so I just... Just to point something out, Psalm 88 is the only psalm where there's no, no glimmer of light in it. Have you, have you ever noticed that? When you read Psalm 88, it's the only psalm, there's nothing positive in it. But isn't it interesting, it's in the book which, uh, where Israel's in exile, and the last psalm in that book is Psalm 89, where you, it's a very Davidic psalm, and the, and, the, and the psalmist says, where are the promises to David? You made unconditional promises to David and they're not coming true. We're in exile. Book four starts, Psalm 90. There's going to be a new exodus. So the Psalms are put together as a collection, and the, and the, and the order of the collection is important. So I would, I would just say to you, that's just something to think about as you read the Psalms. I'm sure um, you've heard this before. Um, just to give you a really simple example, 
you know, Psalm 1, just one example, his, the godly person's delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates it, on it day and night. There's all kinds of connections between the Psalms. Why did a, a nation's rage, and the, you know, I got to see the Hebrew here to make sure I'm right. Yeah, why did the nations rage and the people, the people meditate in vain? So that's the same word. The, the godly meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. The wicked meditate on evil. So again and again, there's link words between these psalms, and it's fascinating to see. That's what Hamilton's going to do in his commentary. So, you know, I did a really little bit of it in my book, but there's very interesting connections between the psalms and... Um, just to encourage you to think along that way in just general terms, I'm happy, I'm happy to say more uh, if you want me to about, about the Psalms, but I, I just don't really know what else to do unless I got into the weeds. Yeah. Well, first of all, first of all, we don't know. We don't have any records of how they were put together. I mean, we know that they were put together in the five books, like the five books of the Pentateuch, right? The five books of the Psalms. So clearly we have the five books. No one, no one in the ancient world preserved records to tell us about the process because the Psalms are at different dates, right? And they're, and they're put together in this way. So. So we, we can only guess and speculate how they were put together. Now, uh, the, the, I, argue, I believe that the inscriptions of the Psalms, not everybody agrees with this, but I believe those are in also inspired. So, um, so I think those are early inspired commentary. I think they're part of the Psalms as well. So we get a little information from those. Then, then I would say, it's not surprising that we wouldn't see the connections, but then I would say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, you, you'd have to see, for example, when Hamilton's book comes out, whether you think it's uh, convincing. By the way, other people are, are doing this. Gerald Wilson in the NIVAC commentary. Do you know the NIVAC series, the New International Version Application Commentary? Gerald Wilson, Wilson has an approach like this. I don't agree with everything Gerald does, but I think it's helpful. Um, I don't know where Gerald is on all the critical issues. I mean, but he's in NIVAC, but you, you always have to consider that with Old Testament scholars. And then, I forget his first name, but McCann, M-C-C-A-N-N, -N, his work on the Psalms. Now, McCann is defi definitely historical critical, so you, you, there may be things you, you want to be careful of, but he approaches the Psalms this way, and I... I learned a lot from reading him. So, so my answer, which is kind of not the greatest answer, my answer is taste and see. <laughs> I think it's true, though. If you, if, you, if, you ex if you see what people are doing, I think you begin to see, wow, there is something to this. Not everybody agrees. Some people think there isn't something to it, so you make up your own mind. But I, I think there's a... There, you know, why, why is it preserved for us in five books? Isn't there some significance in that? And I, th I think there is. I mean, J J Jim, you, you could even, you know, Jim Hamilton is the pastor at Kenwood Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and he's been preaching through the Psalms. So another way you could get a little taste of this is, I think all his sermons are online. You could go listen to some of his sermons. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't know if the book divisions are inspired. I guess I kind of lean in that direction. But, yeah. The, the, I mean, those aren't words, right, in the same way. So I don't know what I use it. I've, I've never been asked that question before. That's a good question. You've never asked it before. You, you've never asked it, and I've never answered it. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think they're, they're, I think it's an intent, the way it's, the canon is put together, I think is intentional and significant, yeah.
Kenwood Baptist Church, K K E N W O O D, Kenwood. Yeah. So you know you might want to listen to some of his sermons and see see what you think. I haven't listened to a single one of them. I mean, you know, I'm busy. We're all busy. Uh, I mean, Jim's a good friend, and uh, see what see what you think. But I know, you know. I don't know how he's doing it. Is he preaching all 150? I think he's combining some together, you know. That's a long time in the Psalms. <laughs> so. hmm, maybe you covered this in your chapter, but uh, kind of any, any thoughts on Psalm 110 in particular and its you know, prevalent position in the New Testament? Well, I think, it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's significant that Psalm 110 is in Book 5. Because uh, if the if the if the if the book is moving towards consummation and the reigning of the king, then Psalm 110, very early in the fifth book, indicates that that God God's rule is going to come through a king, and um, clearly from Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders, they didn't see the significance of that psalm that the one who's David's son is also his Lord. And I think that plays a programmatic role in the New Testament uh, because the Jews, some of the Jews tended to think the Messiah would only be a human being. So this, this, I think Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, and of course the other New Testament writers pick up on this, that the, the Messiah is also divine. He's also David's Lord. He's his son and his Lord. So, and of course, the New Testament picks that up mainly in saying that Jesus is the exalted one. He's reigning at the right hand of God. Now, now he's at God's right hand and he's reigning and ruling until all enemies are put beneath his feet. So Hebrews, Hebrew, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews uh, 1.13, Hebrews what, 8.1, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I, maybe I missed one, but it, it's sort of like the key verse in Hebrews that Jesus is the reigning, the reigning Lord. And what about the relationship in Psalm 1? In, in Hebrews 2? In Hebrews 2, maybe in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, I th I th the, the way I would put that together is human beings were ordained to rule the world, Psalm 8. But that rule is going to come through a king. That, that rule is going to come through the last Adam, who is also the Messiah, who is also the Lord. So the rule that God intended Adam and Eve to have, the rule that God intended human beings to have, that's going to come through a king. Psalm 2 as well. So I think the Psalms are saying, so I, that's why I think it fits with my book. I think the Psalms are saying that rule is going to come through a king, a king, a Messiah, who's also a Lord. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Yeah. It's very helpful, you know, it's so helpful to put those things together. You know, you know another book on the Psalms that I found very helpful. It's not so much biblical theology, but I think it's a very helpful, very short little book. And I forget the title, but it's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer on the Psalms. Now Bonhoeffer it's it's some people think Bonhoeffer is a liberal. Al Mohr thinks he's a liberal. Uh, Eric McTaxis thinks he's a conservative. Do you know that name, Eric McTaxis? Um, I tend to think he's a conservative, but I don't know. Maybe Mueller's right. But, you know, uh, it, I, I, I just read Bonhoeffer with reader response theory. You know? Because it doesn't matter. really doesn't matter. Uh, he's not inspired. And the way I understand Bonhoeffer, I understand him in long, more conservative lines. And but if he, if you if you think he's uh, if you think he's more liberal, uh, you know, avoid him. So, but I think his book on the Psalms is great. Anything else you want to say? I'm not advocating reader response to the scriptures. Okay, <laughs> don't say I said that, because I actually don't believe Bonhoeffer is the Bible. Right? <coughs> Shocking statement. I know. <laughs>